All right, and welcome to the show today. Today I have a very special guest, and I'm really excited to have him here. Uh, it's been a couple months in the works, but I have uh, Mike Butler, one of the young guns from uh, Tasty Works, Tasty Trade, here today with me. And welcome, Mike. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, um, this is great. I, um, I've always loved Tasty Trade, and you're a very respected group online. Um, just as far as options education, as far as just uh, theory, really, um, and also um, as a, a foil to the CNBCs of the world. Um, if you know, if you're watching right now, then you probably already know that um, new media is the way to go now. And we, uh, people, the average age of people watching like MSNBC or CNBC is like uh, 65 years old or something. And this is where it's at now. And tasty trade is at the forefront of that. So, um, um, but one of the things I want to ask you about, um, is we have, um, sort of similar philosophies in that, um, I came from the SIBO as well as did most of tasty works, but I guess we differ a little bit. Um, one thing I noticed about tasty works is that you guys tend to sort of root for things to the downside a little bit. So a day like today, when we have a little action to the downside, it seems to be like a perfect day for you folks. Is that is that true? Do you do you, do you guys lean short a little bit? Yeah, that's that's definitely true. Um, so Tasty Works is the brokerage firm, so they're you know the more of, of course they're doing all the business stuff. They have the brokerage firm, they have the trading platform, and everything. Tasty Trade is the people on the content network, and that you'll you'll see Tom and Tony talking about how they normally have short deltas. Um, I think they've always had kind of a grudge against the consistent and relentless rally that you've been seeing. Um, but at the same time, if you're holding short delta, when you dig into options and you learn more about the Greeks, having short delta is actually a nice hedge against sh having short Vega. So if you're naturally selling premium and most of your strategies are premium selling strategies, having that short delta is a great way to hedge against like a move like today, even if you didn't have... Um, if you just had premium selling trades and they were all neutral, you probably saw a little bit of an uptick in implied volatility, which is of course going to hurt your positions in terms of a decay standpoint. So having that negative delta does help a lot in terms of, you know, how can you hedge your Vega? Having that short delta is one of the answers. Okay. Well, let's, um, let's back up for some people who aren't like totally op option savvy because that's a lot to digest in, in, <laughs> in, in one moment. It's interesting um, how, you know, I, I was a market maker for a long time and we had sort of a philosophy of like, when volatility is cheap, you buy it. When volatility is expensive, you sell it. But mm -hmm. as uh, the world has turned to more of a retail world, it, the uh, it's kind of shifted to more of a if volatility is cheap, you lay off, and if volatility is expensive, you sell it. There's no longer sort of that much of an opportunity to get like, get long premium and make money on it. Would you agree with that? It is tough. I mean, especially if, especially if you're if you're trading volatility specifically, because of the nature of volatility and its consistent grind down to the downside and consistent contraction that we've seen. It is very hard to become long volatility at least and eventually see you know a sustainable profitability from doing that at least all the research that we've shown we do years and years of back testing and then we we look at certain strategies that may or may not have worked and just being long volatility is just so hard to be sustainably profitable in because you you're really betting on a big spike to the upside and you're while you're holding that position you you know or you should know that you're going to have some sort of contraction against you whether it's Theta decay going against you if you have a lot of extrinsic value in your option, or if you just have a consistent grind down in volatility. Like February is a perfect example where we saw the the volatility apocalypse or volpocalypse, where you had XIV go out of business, SVXY drop from one hundred and twenty dollars stock to a ten dollars stock, and that's that kind of situation that you're playing for to the upside. But now you look at volatility and it's right back where we were before, where we're in the low teens. We went from you know, 30 in the VIX futures down to the low teens. So this is kind of this systematic nature of the beast. And that's why I think this is an interesting topic today, talking about volatility and, and dealing with those sort of products just because they're, they're such crazy animals and it, it's hard to predict what they're going to do. But there is a lot of, uh, you know, risk on either side for sure. 
Well, I appreciate you coming into our world for a little while because uh, most of my viewers actually do trade either VXX, mm -hmm. UVXY, or they, they're just short uh, stock and TVIX maybe, or mm -hmm. they, actually I do have people that trade to the long side as well, um, but that's, that's a real uh, central uh, of most people who who watch this program, I but the show I have live every day is called the Short Vix Show, so that that shows you right there. So yeah. you, um, one of the reasons I wanted to have you on is I really wanted to, for people to know. Uh, I wanted to shine a spotlight on uh, what you're doing with uh, Tasty Trade and your your uh, show and activities. Can can you talk about that for a little a little bit? Um, what what do you uh, are you on every day on Tasty Trade or how does it work? Yes, Sam. So I'm on from 1.20 to 1.40 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, so our shows rotate pretty much every year. I have a different type of show. This year it is with myself and Nick Batista. So he's the son of Tony Batista, one of the main co-hosts on Tasty Trade. And we actually, we talk to people all day, every day. And I'm sure you hear this as well, where if you're answering emails or you're talking to people, the biggest question is, how do I manage a trade that I'm in that's going against me? Um, and that's, that's definitely one of the most frequent questions we get. So we were like, Hey, we get this question all the time. Why not pitch this idea, um, to Tom and, and see if we can do something with this, where we have a show centered around trade management exclusively. Um, so that's the show from 120 to 140. We talk about trade management, whether it's long spreads, short spreads, naked positions, whatever it is, we kind of just break down our management style if something goes against us. And that way, um, people out there hopefully are a little, Create it creates a little bit less of a gray area because I think management is definitely more of an art than a science when you get down to the nitty gritty of it. But that's one of the shows that I'm doing, and then I'm also doing a show right now from 1:40 p.m. to two o'clock Central Standard Time, and that is back in the game. So that is me teaching one of my coworkers how to trade. She actually knew um, pretty, she knew a lot actually before we started, but it was kind of like. It's called, it's called back in the game. So it was about getting her back into the game of trading, making sure that she had a solid foundation of different strategies and concepts. And I think that's a great beginner resource for sure. So how, how did you get hooked up with these guys? Um, I, I watched your, um, your I think it's called like Mike's Black Whiteboard or Mike's, yep. uh, I watched that show and I think that that's fabulous. It's, I, I found for people to learn about options, they really have to see it repeatedly to and you know they they watch it repeatedly they don't get it they don't get it and then all of a sudden it kind of clicks in so you, you're providing a great service with with uh those just basic like understanding of a spread and, and what your options are and that sort of thing is just awesome and i i love to point people towards that because a lot of people that even trade the vix or vix products they they mm -hmm. haven't jumped into the options world yet and so if you if you're one of those people right now that is watching this Go check out uh, Mike and the rest of the guys at Tasty Trade because they they really are at uh, the top of the industry as far as uh, education and options and you know the, and and it goes hand in hand with their Tastyworks platform which has the best commissions. I mean, you, basically half your trades are free because any closing trade you don't pay for, and the other half are at, at the cheapest rates in the industry. So it's it's really uh, uh, a one two punch which you folks offer over there. Um, yeah. yeah, it's, it, it's amazing. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, when uh, did you get started with those guys? So yeah, that's a, it's a funny story actually. So my brother used to work here at Tasty Trade and my mom would send me videos of him on air. And this is before I knew anything about trading at all. So I'd watch these videos and I would be like, what is this kid talking about? He's five years younger than me. And I'm like, why does he know all of this really technical stuff? And I, I have no idea what he's talking about. I need to change this. So he was like, here, watch these videos. And it was like best practices, market measures, things like that, things that were already on Tasty Trade. So I basically would go home and watch, you know, two or three hours a day, every single day. And I used to play poker a lot uh, back in the day when it was legal online. So a lot of the same concepts clicked right away, like bankroll management or portfolio management in terms of trade sizing, things like that. Um, being able to find opportunities with unknown information. A lot of those concepts translated pretty well for me. Um, so one day I just, I came here to meet people. I was randomly on a sales call with my old company. And at the same time, they were like, hey, I know you were, I was a customer service manager before. And they're like, hey, we had just had a guy leave three days ago. So if you want to jump on board, send us your resume. And really the rest is history in terms of 
becoming a, a tasty trade employee. Um, but from the broadcasting standpoint, Mike and his whiteboard was my first show. And that's, that was probably the most popular one. That's, it's really popular on YouTube because of the reasons, like you said, it's very visual, um, great way for beginners to get on board with a lot of the concepts that seem a little bit overwhelming, even though when you break them down in a visual way, they're not too, too hard at all. Um, so that was, we were just talking about different stuff and we had a bunch of people on my team. I was on the business team, the support team. I still answer support emails all the time. Um, but I was seeing that people wanted to learn more about trading, but they didn't really have a, a resource, like a beginner resource. And I was just, I was like, I, I can help you. So let's, let's do this after the close uh, every day. So I literally sat them down in our conference room, same conference room where I'm sitting in right now, actually. And I had a little tiny whiteboard and I would start drawing concepts and strategies and Tom would walk by and see it happening. And then one day he came in, he's like, what are you guys doing? You guys are in here every single day. And I was like, oh, I'm just teaching them, you know, basic stuff on this whiteboard. And they're like, yeah, it's, it's really helpful. It's helping so far. And he's like, well, you're going to do this on air now. And that's basically what had happened. That was my foot in the door was kind of just Tom being like, you're, you're going to try this on air. And I was like, okay, we're doing it. Well, that's great. And, you know, it is, um, it is kind of the way I learned to trade as well because I learned at a trading firm. And so after the close, we go up upstairs and we would try to um, do mock trading. So we'd have a blackboard where we write the markets down. And then we'd have one guy who was like, would update the quotes and another guy would update the stock price. And then we'd make markets and we'd, you know, we'd do an opening rotation and we'd go down and I was on a, on a, on a blackboard. And it was a similar thing, and it's it's a I think it's a great visual way to uh, to do things. H how many people are, are working for Tasty Trade these days? Um, I would say between seventy and eighty, somewhere wow. around there. So it's still a pretty small, tight knit group. Um, but we've got a full production studio. Um, Tasty Works is just down the street, so we're um, you know really close in proximity. And yeah, we've we've been growing pretty substantially, especially the Tasty Works side for sure. Wow, that's awesome. And I, I see they've been doing a bunch of road trips as well. Have you have you been involved with any of that road trip stuff? So I have not really yet. I went to Vegas last year for the Traders Expo or the Money Show. I forget which one it was um, specifically. But I was there in November, I believe. I'm actually going to be speaking, though, at the July Traders Expo in Chicago. Oh, wow. So I'll be speaking on Sunday. Um, and I'm just be, I'll be talking about some option premium stuff. But I'm going to definitely start getting my foot more in that live event door because I think that's super fun, super powerful stuff. And I think people really like to see that. Yeah, I was definitely like the concept for me when I first uh, was thinking about having someone from your, your group on was to was to actually not have uh, Tom or Bat on, but <laughs> one of you younger guys, because I yeah. think that that uh, there's a million Tom Sosnoff interviews out there, you know, and, and mm -hmm. uh and uh, it's really you guys who are who are really uh, the energy and are, are, you know can convince people that that a, a retail person can 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 do this and it's not just old time market makers that are uh, you know adapting or something like that. Um, so um, yeah, so let's uh, let's talk about um, uh, UVXY and the VIX and all that and see if we can uh, craft a trade or two. I was thinking like of maybe trying to do some sort of short delta trade, whether it be for if, you know, there's a spike and you want to kind of jump on uh, to uh, sort of like thinking that the VIX going to mean revert or, or you want to take advantage of sort of like contango or something like that. And uh, everybody's always asking me what would be a good way to short uh, one of these products being uh, with the, uh, the risk that, you know, the risk to VIX products is that you're going to get a spike to the upside. You know, it's going to yeah. explode to the upside as opposed to most other products. So you've got the reverse sort of skew on there. And uh, so people are always asking me, well, what would be a good trade to get short one of these things? Maybe they can't get short stock because they're so hard to borrow. And yeah. uh, what, what, would, uh, what would you suggest for somebody? Um, so I agree with you. I think shorting the stock is... Um, a no, no for me personally, just because like you said, with a normal market velocity is to the downside, but with volatility velocity is to the upside. Um, so, and like you saw in February, there's, it can explode 200% in one day. Um, so I think that the, if I were to do something to the downside, I really like to use something like a short call spread or a long put spread. 
um, anytime I'm going to be doing something to the downside like this, I really like to just do my best to cover the extrinsic value. So with a short call spread, you don't have to worry about that if you're doing it out of the money short call spread. Uh, but with a, something like a long put spread where you might have a little bit more profit potential, the one downside to something like that is just the extrinsic value that's going to decay if you're long that put and there's a ton of extrinsic value in that put. Um, so normally what I would do is just look at what the market's giving me with something like UXY, maybe I, I, it's, we're kind of in a weird spot because our wheelhouse is right around 45 days till expiration for options trades just because that's what we've shown uh, is when the theta decay starts to ramp up, which is good for short premium positions. And it can be good for long premium positions too if you set it up in a certain way where you're you know, covering the extrinsic value in the long option with the sale of your short. Um, so I probably teeter between July and August. Um, and it's interesting because UVXY is so low right now, $10. I wouldn't be surprised to see like a reverse split in here. I feel like this is whenever I see a reverse split where it goes back up to 30 or 40, it's usually around these levels. So I think that's another thing to potentially consider too. Yeah, I think most people are are of the uh, the thought that we probably would have to take out the all time low, which is I think eight fifty six to get that that split. We did get the reverse split in TVIX a couple weeks ago. I think it was like in the high sixes, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, that that kind of changes the game because if if you are doing a farther out strategy of say like if like you're if you're playing with like Jan or quote unquote leaps. Yeah. Uh, you, you get the split and all of a sudden that's a really illiquid option. You got to do this extra math to figure out what's going on. And it's, I like to stay away from that stuff. So, yeah, uh, yeah, Great. that's definitely something to think about that split coming up. Yeah. Yeah. But, um, I, I ultimately, if we're, if we're talking about UVXY, first thing I'll do is just check out where the value is right now. Um, implied volatility is always going to be super high in, under, in underlines like this. So, 124% is what I'm getting for the July cycle uh, in the Tastyworks platform. But the way that I would look at it is basically if I'm going to play this short to the downside, I'm definitely going to do something like a short call spread, long put spread. If I were to go with a short call spread, I would probably go closer to at the money and just make sure my risk reward is kind of in check. So something like, you know, an 11. 13 spread or maybe like a 12 13 spread or 11 12 um, That's just be I like to go at the money with spreads like that Just because you you it's a much better a much easier way to keep your risk in check um, Whereas if you went with something like an 11 15 like a super wide spread you're uh, You know you're collecting a lot more But that's when your risk starts to get a little skewed to the risk side and if this was a normal underlying I wouldn't be so concerned with that, but because this thing could explode to 20 tomorrow, um, that's kind of why I like to keep my risk in check if I'm doing something like a short call spread. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 kind of lame that the uh, there's so much of a skew to the out-of-the-money calls because it kind of collapses the premium on this short call spread. I mean, if there was no skew, you'd probably get a lot more premium on some of these things. So it's kind of like you're selling something that's artificially cheap. Yeah. Uh, um, but still, you know, I think the farther out of the money you have on a, on a, uh, on a call spread, you, you know, the more percent chance you have of it being a winner, but the less return on investment you have. So it's kind of a, a um, risk reward thing to figure yeah. out. Um, these things tend to grind down over a long period of time. Sometimes I think um, of, doing like a put spread that's actually uh, lower strikes, but that's like farther out, like say a Jan, what would you think of doing like a Jan uh, eight, six put spread, something like that? Um, you know, we've got contango of about 5%, which is about 50 cents in decay per month or something like that. So this thing's slowly going to roll downhill, all things being equal. But I, I guess you, you do have some risk that vol could explode still. But if you're going farther out, um, you've got um, less decay per day, less data per day, uh, and more time for for to be right. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I if this so because we know that volatility grinds down, I don't. I, I actually I have 
nothing wrong with this strategy. I think it's it's definitely a, a nice way to get short volatility, keeping your risk reward in check like this. Eight six and Jan trading for a dollar ten. You're basically at a risk one to make one scenario, and you know that's if you're if you want to make a directional bet, I think that's what you got to do. Keep your risk reward in check. Um, but yeah, I think the the one thing, the one difference, and this is why I think this is cool because I, if you wanted to go longer data, there's there's plenty of benefits to that. Um, and when you compare it to going to a shorter date like July or August, there's pros and cons. So you look at July and August. If this thing grinds down and we don't get a spike, then of course you're going to be able to be profitable in the short term much faster because you're getting that decay of extrinsic value. Your options would hopefully gain that uh, or show that intrinsic value because you no longer have that extrinsic value that's kind of battling against you. Um, but of course, the con is if you get a spike and you're in July or August, you you might need that to contract really fast in order to be profitable. So the, the longer term trades, I think they have a, they're much more conservative, which I like um, in terms of like a volatility contraction play. Cause you know, even if you get a huge spike based on what we've seen in history, it's not guaranteed that it's going to contract tomorrow or the next day or the next week. But we know historically it does tend to settle down. That's just the nature of, of how the markets react. What would be, I just want to run this by you. What, what would be, what would you think of Hanging on the sidelines, waiting for a spike of some sort, and then mm -hmm. selling some naked calls. Like at the money, let's say August, I don't know, 15, August 20 calls naked. Um, yeah. I, and then, uh, you know, it, hanging out for a spike to say, like, let's say, I know it might never come, but the spike to like 12, 14, mm -hmm. and then selling at the money or out of the money calls. Is that too risky would you think um uh, i would so here's my thing with volatility so some people like to short it naked um i personally don't like to short it naked just because i think that whatever whatever prop uh credit you're getting from that naked call um uh, if you get a spike in implied volatility of course the, the chance of the spike continuing is theoretically lower uh, just because you're already seeing that spike as it is but it certainly could go higher. And I think just from my personal experience, if I'm going to do something like that, I think I, I totally agree with you. I would rather wait for the spike just because if I'm playing it to the downside and you and I both know this, when you see that spike, that's usually when you get that big velocity to the downside in volatility product. Or you can see this on any chart. If you look at UVXY or the VIX, the February 5th crash that we had, mini crash for this year, um, you saw it spike to 30 and then it went quickly down back to the downside. So um, I think to answer your question, I personally like to go defined risk regardless of what's happening. Um, just because I think that when you get that, spike, you're going to have a better opportunity from the short side because premium is going to be a little bit higher. Um, but I still prefer to do something like a long put spread or short call spread. And I think you can you can manipulate those spreads to give you the same effect. So let's say you get that spike to 15 in UVXY or 20 in the extreme. You can create a spread that gives you the ability to make three, four, five hundred dollars on you know a 10 or 15 dollar wide spread. And if it goes against you, you could, in the example of like a long put spread, you could roll that put up continue to chip away at that cost basis. And that's why I like those kind of strategies because when you break it down that way, you're ultimately um, going to be sitting on a situation where you have a long spread with plenty of time to go and the initial debit you pay, or you, usually with a long spread, the initial debit you pay, if it goes against you, you can reduce that pretty substantially. And that's one of the things that we talk about on trade. the trade manager show is that if you start off with a debit of you know a thousand dollars on a twenty point wide spread, you still have twenty points of room, or ten points of room, I should say, to where you can move that short option closer and still stand to make a small profit, not as big of a profit, but it's a nice way to to think about that if things go against you. But a long winded answer to your question, um, I prefer to go defined risk. I think that after a spike. If I were to go undefined risk, I would be more comfortable doing it. But I still like to just go defined risk because of all the tools that we have with spreads and stuff like that. 
Um, I know that um, Tasty Trade has made a, a pretty, uh, I would say, a, a, a very good case for the um, for managing trades. As far as by that I mean uh, for when a you put a trade on and it goes, uh, it makes you some money to consider taking it off uh, sometime ahead of maximum profitability or something like that. Um, and I've seen several studies that y'all have done uh, uh, on on that. Is that um, one of your key philosophies as a trader to uh, to to manage uh, winning trades? Yes, absolutely. Um, I think that there's always a case for holding something, letting it. Um, you know, decay in your favor a little bit more. I think from a case by case basis, maybe I hold something a little bit longer, maybe I hold something a little bit shorter. But when you think about it from risk reward, it starts to make more sense. So let's say in the same example, we create a 20 point wide spread that we bought for $10. So we can, we spent $10, we can make $10 on this 20 point wide spread. If we start making money, we have an unrealized gain, let's say of $500. So I, I now have made $500 because it's a spread. The only additional capital I can make is another $500. If, if you analyze the risk reward, you're now holding $15 of risk because you haven't closed it and you can only make $500 more. So now your risk reward has skewed from one to one to four to one. So that's really the that's really where we're coming from when it comes to managing winning trades. It's, it's the question of, Yes, I can make more holding this trade, but is it worth the risk that I'm currently holding? Because nothing is guaranteed that could reverse, you know, the next day. Well, I've got a lot of people who uh, trade the VIX and VIX products to the short side, but mm -hmm. I I have to give uh, a little time to those folks who uh, who do like to roll the dice and go long these things in anticipation of catching it just right. So for that guy out there who says, look, I'm directional. I feel like the end of the world is happening tomorrow and, or, you know, in the next week. And, mm -hmm. uh, and I want to position myself in a cheap way using options to take advantage of that. I know, you know, that I, I, it's going to happen next week. We're going to, the big one is coming. How, what would you suggest they, how, how could they, uh, they position themselves using options to limiting their risk, but being able to take advantage of that, that sort of uh, move, big spike move. That's a great question. I think everyone wants, everyone has that feeling of, you know, this, when's this going to end? When can it end? Like it's got to spike eventually. Um, I think that first of all, from the long side, um, just like the short side, I think from the long side, I'm much more comfortable going out in time. Um, even to, if I wanted to do this, it would be like, you know, August, September, um, somewhere like that between that range. I, I see no, nothing wrong with going to January either, just because the more time you give yourself to be successful and right, I think the, especially with a volatility spike like that, um, where I'm sure it'll happen eventually, you just have to position yourself to be there for when it does happen. Um, I'm much more comfortable going further out in time rather than a shorter duration. So from the long side, I would say July is out of the question for me. I would much rather go to August or beyond. Um, but at the same time, because we know that volatility does tend to contract, we have this constant grind to the downside. I think it's super important to, uh, if I'm going to do like a long call spread, I want to make sure that I'm covering the extrinsic value that I'm buying. The good thing is, though, if you look at the in-the-money options in UVXY, even in August, September, December, there's not too much extrinsic value. Um, even in like the seven, six, five, there's barely anything in there, um, which is, of course, you know, good for the person that wants to become long this thing. But at the same time, you can reduce your basis pretty significantly. Like in UVXY, I'm looking at September right now. Uh, longer, more longer term than what we would normally do with a regular trade. But in the September cycle, you could sell a call against um, your option that you buy at even the 20 strike and reduce your cost basis by a dollar. So I think that's huge, especially when you're um, looking at trades like this, where you could buy like a five strike option, which is significantly in the money, reducing the, the extrinsic value that you're buying, which I think is the way to do it. And then Reduce your cost basis by just selling another option that's far out of the money, and 
best case scenario is you get that spike all the way to the upside, your spread goes in the money, and you can get some profit out of this without actually uh, putting up the full value of that five strike option. So reducing cost basis, I think, is the, the key for something like that. That's an interesting answer because I was sure you were going to say something like, oh, buy like weekly out of the money calls for two cents or something like that. Um, but yeah, that's that's a great answer because what you're effectively doing is taking advantage of the skew. You know, the skew is that, is that those downside puts, mm -hmm. uh, i.e. in the money calls, yep. are cheap and are, 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 are cheaper than everything else uh, because the risk is to the upside. And so you, you can use that to your advantage and, and buy the skew to... Uh, to um, get long, which is, that sounds good. I, I was watching, it must have been like six months ago. I'm not sure if it was you, but somebody else was was playing to the long side a little bit in UVXY. Uh, and I, I have people who are, I ha uh, this is talking to you, Sal, one of my buddies out there who's always asking permission to get long TVX, and I'm saying, lay off it, lay off it, lay off it, lay off it. But, uh, you know, um, these people that were playing to the long side were right for all of February. The, the, uh, contango sort of collapsed in the the term structure and so there was no real penalty for getting long uh tvix or uvxy and that they weren't really decaying at all or they were doing the opposite of decaying and so it was it was a good time to get long so longs had their sort of revenge over the last couple months uh and it's kind of switched back around now but um but you know there 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 are those people out there who do want to uh, to, to make that gamble. And, you know, me and I, I, I think I, you would agree with me that for us as people who want to try to make money all the time in the market, we'd rather bet three to make one than bet one to make three because that way we have, a, you know, a higher probability trade that comes in and makes us a little money as opposed to, a, a, you know, a real low probability trade, it seems. Yeah, totally. And I think if, if you want to play it to the upside or downside, I think you just need to look at it objectively, highlight the pros and cons. And I think the big con for the upside play is that you're going to have this constantly grinding against you. We actually did a, a really cool study about clustering of volatility. So what we've shown is that based on history, when you have big spikes in implied volatility, that those levels don't tend to hold for a very long time. But when you have low volatility levels like we're in now, the 12s, 13s, 14s, those tend to cluster and become very longer term or very much, very much long term uh, experiences in the market where I would not be surprised to see this volatility level, as much as I hate to say this, I would not be this surprised to see this volatility level be here for a couple of months or more just because of the way that things have tended to work in the past, things that the way that the market tends to act when we have these low volatility levels. And I can send you that this study as well so you can link it for anyone that's watching this. We can provide it to them as well. Yeah, that yeah, that sounds cool. Um, let me run by you just the strategy I've been using lately to see what you think of it. I, I've been buying uh, December puts on mm -hmm. a spike and then I've been sort of turning them into calendar spread. I, so I've been buying like December 9 puts for two, 240s, 250s around there and then selling front week, a couple week out nine puts against them and collecting a little decay you know as we get back down to the kind of that baseline level of like nine and a half or wh whatever the low of the last few weeks is I'll, I'll sell some puts against my long ones and that way i'm covering sort of covering my decay for the weeks and then as we get a move up i will cover my short puts and get short again and then kind of ride it back down does that sound like a reasonable strategy to you yeah i think i honestly think that um Number one, with anything that we're trading, I think cost basis reduction is the key. I think even if we have a very strong directional assumption, if we can still put in that cost basis reduction component, we're going to be much better off in the long run. Um, a lot of people ask, like, what's the one strategy you would do if you were to do it forever? And I say selling puts and equities just because you're going to be better off if the stock market's flat. You're going to be better off if the stock market's down, and you're still going to make money if the stock market goes up. Sure, you're not going to make as much money as if I was long like Facebook over the last couple of months right now. But if I was selling puts in Facebook, I'm still going to be profitable. So I think cost basis reduction is key. Um, and with volatility products, I'm a big believer in waiting for that spike, especially playing it to the downside. But at the same time, if you're if you have long put spreads, the worst that's going to happen is that debit that you've paid if you're you know, if you're looking at it from that perspective. So 
reducing the cost basis, like you said, buying those longs after the spike, and then reducing the basis, watching it collapse down, hopefully in your favor, and at the same time reducing the cost basis, even if it doesn't. I think that's a, a nice strategy for sure. Well, there you go, folks. Uh, Tasty Trade. I'm going to date myself here, but Tasty Trade has turned the uh, options markets on its head because 20 years ago, the retail average retail customer was coming in and buying calls, taking shots, and stuff. And now. Uh, the average customer is being taught what the pros were always doing, which is selling premium and collecting that money every day. And here's a, a perfect example of it. Um, you know that your idea of the perfect strategy is the complete opposite of what retail thought was the perfect strategy 20 years ago. And so you're doing a huge service to uh, everybody who's watching and the retail world with Tasty Works and Tasty I'm sorry, Tasty Trade and um, not just you but the whole the whole company. And I, I, I really like to shine a spotlight on it because I think it's a great thing and uh, it, it's great to teach everybody about options. So thank you so much for your your part in that. And I thank you so much for coming on the show because uh, this is really cool. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. It was fun. All right, great. Um, and I'm going to leave a link in the description to uh, how you can uh, sign up for Tastyworks. And I would recommend checking it out. And check out Mike's show. Um, it's every day at 1.30, did you say? One uh, twenty to 2 o'clock is the cluster that I have right now. So and one twenty. And just go to, uh, to tastytrade.com and you can get hooked up with that show. And um, links will be in the description. Thanks so much, Mike, for coming on. This is really exciting. I want to thank uh, Brittany for all that she did towards this. Uh, she's a, another real star. I mean, she's been really fabulous. So um, kudos to her as well. Th uh, so thank her for all she's done. And thank you. And we will see you next time. Thanks for watching and keep trading.